to our Sunday morning service at 10 o'clock. It's great to be with you to, here to worship the Lord and to those online. Um, it's great that you can join us online and watch on YouTube. Uh, it's good also to welcome our visiting preacher and visiting uh, chorister, Martin Taylor, um, who will be uh, helping us on a, on a number of fronts um, uh, throughout the service. And thank you to for those of you who prayed for the toddler group, um, which started this week. We had a really happy start. A good little number of kids, uh, new families, people who had nothing to do with church came, and, and it's a really happy thing. So if you know anyone who's got uh, toddlers um, and they could do with somewhere to take them and uh, have the fellowship of other tired parents, uh, then 9 till 10.30 on Wednesdays in the lounge, little steps. So thank you for that. It's been a, it's been a term, well it's been a week really, of things restarting. So the 8 o'clock communion service started this morning. Uh, the all age service starts formally uh, this afternoon, once a month at 3.30. Do come along to that. It's very unlike this service. Interactive songs, all age songs, actions, crafts, that kind of thing. But great uh, for anyone with kids or anyone uh, without kids who might be young at heart and like that sort of thing. This Thursday, uh, in the lounge, our 10 o'clock communion midweek will restart. Um, so I know a number of you have been looking forward to that beginning again. So that starts then. And then next Sunday at 4 o'clock, uh, our Book of Common Prayer evening service restarts too. Uh, nearly there. Two more. Um, at 7.30 on Wednesdays, we're going to have our online midweek Bible study. Uh, and what we're doing in that is we're taking whatever's been preached on the Sunday before um, and we're chewing on it. We're thinking a bit more about it, to go a bit deeper, maybe ask questions about it, things we didn't like, didn't understand. Uh, whatever it is, it's a chance for us to interact together and encourage one another and then pray for each other uh, as we share life together. And then also coming up on Tuesday the 28th, uh, we're starting our online app, of course we've got some, uh, a good bunch of people already lined up for that, um, but that's starting on the 28th online. If you want to go along to that, uh, send me an email and get in touch by phone. It's a great refresher on the Christian basics. So if you've been a Christian for a while, you will have heard it all before, but you might well find it comes to you in a fresh and powerful and, and life-giving way. At least that's what a lot of people have experienced. There's the weekly sheet um, for anything else. Here they endeth the notices. <laughs> Let us pray. <coughs> Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us and you want to draw near to us now and meet with us. And so we pray you would, through the songs, through the word uh, read and preached, through the sacraments, in our prayers, would we do business with you and be built up by you in faith and hope and love. In Jesus' name. Amen. And please stand as we sing our first hymn. We have a gospel to proclaim.
Let us worship God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. This is the day that the Lord has made. We, we will rejoice and be glad in it. Please sit as we make our confession to God. <clears throat> as we live in God's world, we do not live as pleases him all the time. Often we turn away from him. So we make our confession to him, knowing that he is a forgiving God and merciful, and through Christ has purchased our forgiveness. We say together, O God, our loving Father, we know that you forgive us when we turn to you. We ask you to forgive us for the wrong things we have done, and the good things we have not done. We have forgotten to love you, and we have forgotten to love one another. We are truly sorry. We turn again to you. Please help us to lead better lives every day, for Jesus' sake. Amen. So may the Father of all mercies wash away your sins and mine, and set each one of us on fire with his Spirit, through his Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. As the forgiven people of God, let's pray the collect together. Lord of creation, whose glory is around and within us, open our eyes to your wonders that we may serve you with reverence and know your peace at our lives end. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This morning's reading is Philippians 1, verses 12 to 30. I want you to know, you, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel, so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else, that my imprisonment is for Christ, and most of the brothers and sisters, having been made confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, dare to speak the word with great boldness and without fear. Some proclaim Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. These proclaim Christ out of love, knowing that I have been put here for the defence of the gospel. The others proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but intending to increase my suffering and my imprisonment. What does it matter, just this, that Christ is proclaimed in every way, whether out of false motives or true, and in that I rejoice? Yes, and I will continue to rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will result in my deliverance. It is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be put to shame in any way, but that by speaking with all boldness, Christ will be exalted, now as always in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labour for me, and I do, know, do not know which I prefer. I am hard pressed between the two. two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better, but to remain in the flesh is far more necessary for you. Since I am convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are in no way intimidated by your opponents. For them this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation, and this is God's doing. For he has graciously granted you the privilege, not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well. Since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have, this is the word of the Lord. Well, hello everybody again. It's great to be with you. I'm just switching myself on. Is that better? You can hear me now. Great, lovely to be with you again after a break for August. Um, I always enjoy my visits here. 
to St John's. And uh, if you've, um, that passage from Philippians is on your service sheet if you want to refer to it uh, from time to time as I point it out. And uh, let's pray as we come to God's word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for our, uh, the freedom that we've got to look at this uh, book to the Philippians, this letter to the Philippians, and we pray that you would open our eyes today to see what's in it for us and how you might speak to us in our situation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if there's one verse I want to pick out of all of it, I need to look at the whole of the passage, but one verse I think that stands out is verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. Now I'm going to tell you a story. Um, this is a book by Tom Wright, who after you believe, Bishop Tom Wright, former Bishop of uh, Durham. And uh, he's written quite a lot of stuff. Uh, but anyway, he's telling a story of once where he, he's talking about somebody who, whatever happens, was conducting himself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. How, what, I wonder, it's a church setting, but I wonder what you've done in this situation. He says, I was in a huge service in an enormous church, I think he means a cathedral, with wonderful music, flowing robes, and a crowd of thousands, literally packed out. And they only just fitted into the building. Suddenly, about ten minutes into the service, some men pushed their way roughly past the ushers at the door, injuring one of them, and ran into the church, shouting slogans. The disruption was caused by a protest group that had recently acquired a national reputation for behaving outrageously in pursuit of their cause. Which, by the way, had nothing directly to do with the church or any of the people there. The protesters reached the front of the church, shouted some more slogans, waved their placards, and then simply stopped. Clearly, they hadn't decided what to do next, if they would managed to get that far. But nobody in the church also had any idea about what to do next. Uh, the ushers were clearly frightened and unsure how to proceed. Nobody wanted to see, except perhaps the protesters, who would have loved to be carried out by the police, shouting more slogans as they went. While the service had been massively disrupted as it was, scuffles and the violence necessary in restraint would have just soured the atmosphere even more. As all of us wondered what would happen next, one of the senior clergy walked quietly across toward the leading protester and had a short, quiet conversation with him. He then walked over to the presiding cleric for another brief conversation. A moment later, the presiding cleric spoke to the congregation, informing them that our unexpected guests had agreed to state their case for three minutes and then leave the building quiet. How was it done? I was in awe of the man who stepped forward and spoken with a protester. I wouldn't have known what on earth to do. I'd have been frightened with the group of protesters. What, and what might they do if I approached them? I was worried I'd make matters worse by my words or actions. Apparently, as I discovered later, this person pointed out that they had made their protest. That if they continued much longer, they would alienate more people than they influenced. But how had he been able to do it so calmly? And then I remembered Many years before, watching the same cleric walk down a street in one of our busy cities, dressed as a priest, he stopped quietly. He sat down on the pavement to chat with a group of men who were drinking methylated spirits. He made his approach look natural. They received it that way. He was on his way to preach the service, but he didn't appear to be in a hurry. Such meetings were obviously already a habit. He knew from long experience how to speak calmly and wisely with people of whom most others would be afraid. By the time it came to that great service 15 or more years later, the habit of faith and love and courage had long been fully formed. And when the moment came, he didn't have to think about it. Second nature kicked in. He knew authentically what to do and how to do it. I've learned many things from that man, but this one stands out, he says. And if you want to know, or if you think you can guess who that is, you can have a chat to me afterwards and I'll tell you. He does say so in the book. You're going to be thinking then, I'm going to do that once. <laughs> well, as we come to this passage, uh, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The first question I, I want us to ask, which is crucial to this, is what is the gospel? If we're to conduct ourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel, what is the gospel? 
Well, what is it about the gospel that actually shapes the way that we behave? Well, in our passage, the gospel is all about Jesus. So if we start at verse uh, 12 and 13, the beginning of our reading, now I want you to know, brothers, what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it's become clear throughout the whole palace garden to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. What is the gospel? The gospel is all about Jesus. Verse 18, what does it matter when he's talking about all these other preachers? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. The gospel is all about Jesus. I want you to imagine, because Paul is in prison here, Paul is in Rome, he's going to be standing trial before Caesar because he's appealed to Caesar. It was the way he thought, I can get myself out of these internal prisons all around uh, the Mediterranean, I'm going to appeal to Caesar, I'm going to be able to get to Rome, and I'm going to, to state my case before the leader of the known world. And he was in prison in Caesar's palace, guarded by the Praetorium, the elite bodyguards of Caesar, who changed guard every four hours. Paul uh, wasn't a terrorist or an insurrectionist. He was allowed to have a room, but he had a Roman guard with him. Every four hours he got a new guard. Oh, what are you here for? Uh, you don't look like a troublemaker. No, I'm, I'm here because of my belief in Jesus Christ. Oh, what's that? Oh, Jesus? Don't you know about Jesus? Well, he, uh, we believe that he was the Son of God. He, he had a wonderful ministry in Israel, where I come from, where my people come from. He lived a life of love. He went around doing signs and wonders and setting people free from the power of the devil. And more than that, he died a death of love. He died a sacrificial death. We believe he died for our sins. And more than that, he was raised victoriously from the grave. He's appeared to me. And yes, one more thing, he's coming back again to judge the living and the dead. The gospel is all about Jesus. And of course, one of the overflows of the good news of Jesus is that we want to talk about it. That's what Paul was doing. He says it's become clear amongst the whole of the palace, Caesar's palace, that I am in chains of Christ. That only becomes clear if Paul tells people why he is there. The natural overflow of the gospel is we talk about Jesus. And of course, there are other preachers doing that in Rome as well. So Paul talks about other people having confidence to speak because he's in prison. You know, he's, Paul, for some, Paul is the hero. If Paul is willing to go to prison for his faith, we're going to stand up and preach as well. We're going to tell other people about the Jesus that we follow. And one of my hopes for the congregation at St. John's here is that we grow in our ability to talk about Jesus. Whether we're at home, in the home, whether we're at work, whether we're in the community, whether we're with our friends, the gospel is all about Jesus. And as was announced this morning, I think there's an alpha course coming up, and that's a great, if, if you want a refresher or reminding how to articulate the gospel, do sign up to the alpha course, because it will help you, give you a framework for talking about Jesus to others. So, the gospel is all about Jesus. Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Secondly, whatever happens, what's the worst that could happen? What's the worst that could happen? You know when you go into hospital, I don't know if you've been to hospital and you're going to have an operation, you have to sign one of those pre-op forms. Do you know what I'm talking about? And you get a list of all the possible things that could possibly go wrong in this operation. Hundreds and hundreds of things. My word, is it worth having this operation? I could die on the slab. <laughs> Happy days, yes. 
But just sign on the dotted line, <coughs> please. And they're just trying to cover themselves so you don't sue them if something goes wrong. Even to that, you do realise that there's a 39% chance of success, though. Okay, I'm not going to weigh this up, I'm not going to do this one, I'm not going to do it. What's the worst that could happen? Whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Well, listen to Paul's context. Remember, he's appealing to Caesar. He's in Rome. It could all go pressure. He could lose his head, literally. So verse 19 to 26. For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. I eagerly expect and hope that I will no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labour for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith, so that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So how does the gospel that we've talked about, the gospel of Jesus, shape Paul's view of death? Well, the gospel is about hope. It's about the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so Paul is able to say, as he might face execution, he says to those, pray that I may make courage, but to die is Gain. Have you ever thought of death like that? To die is gain because I go to the presence of Christ. I will be with Jesus if I die. That is Paul's great hope. Because Jesus has been raised to life. Death holds no fear for the Christian. Because Jesus has defeated it. This is one of the great drivers of Paul's ministry. He has met the resurrected Jesus. He knows that Jesus is Lord and he wants the world to know about it because Jesus sets us free from sin and death. Jesus brings hope and peace in the face of death. Do we believe that? My dad died about five or six years ago and we were around in the kitchen. My daughter would have been about 17 or 18 at the time. And she said, Dad, why are you upset? It would be the day or two up. And I said, Lydia, my dad was a vicar, a priest, by the way. I said, look, Lydia, I know where Dad is. He loved Jesus. He's with the Lord. And Lydia then said to me a few months later, Dad, what you said, um, what you said, you really believed it. It suddenly has a 17-year-old girl. She, I suddenly saw that the faith that you stand up and teach at the front, you really believe, it affected the way that you responded to the death of your father. And I do believe it. Jesus has defeated death. I don't need to fear death. To die is to be with Christ. Better by far, says Paul. But God may have a plan for us to do something here, here right now. And that's why Paul says, well, yet yeah, to live is, uh, to, uh, I'll just find it here, it's fruitful labour, he says. If I live, it's fruitful labour because I'll be able to carry on serving you. In fact, I think that's what God wants me to do. I think he's going to keep me around for a bit longer because you guys need me for a bit longer. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the Gospel of Christ. And I don't think any of us are facing Boris Johnson's sword for being Christians. And therefore we have to ask ourselves the question, what does it mean for fruitful labour for me in the service of Christ and in the service of St John's? How can I get involved? How can I use my gifts? You might want to talk to Greg about that afterwards. 
So what's the gospel? It's all about Jesus. What's the worst that can happen? Well, we can go to be with Jesus. And Paul says that's better by far. What is Christ-like conduct, finally? Conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. At the beginning of lockdown, about 18 months ago, I had a phone call or a message from a, a Pentecostal church in Lincoln that wanted to come and plant in Stanford. So I had a conversation with a person and told them all about Stanford. I said, look, you're welcome. Um, I'm not sure how you get on, but if you want to come when things ease up a little bit, I'll take you around, I'll introduce you to people. If you want to come to Stanford, please feel free to do that. Because actually, from my perspective, the more people um, there are trying to reach people for Christ, that's a good thing. And actually the kind of church that he was running would reach people that we couldn't reach. Do you know, Christ-like conduct is non-defensive. Look at verses 14 to 18 again. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. It's true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I'm put here for the defence of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. You see, Christ-like conduct for Paul is non-defensive. Other people may be pleased that I'm in prison because maybe they follow a different Christian leader. It's like having different denominations in the town. He's not saying um, that, they're, that they're false teachers, it's just saying their motives are a bit mixed. But he's completely non-defensive about people preaching about Jesus, different people preaching about Jesus, because Jesus is being preached. And for him, that's the main thing. It's not about me, says Paul, it's all about Jesus. And so St. John's, as new ministries start, even the service this afternoon, the all-age service, it's all about Jesus and more people having the opportunity to find out about him. As new people come into the church, we welcome them because it's all about Jesus and people having an opportunity to build a relationship with him. Rejoice like Paul I rejoice as all that Christ is being preached. You see, it's not about me, it's about Jesus. So Christ-like conduct is non-defensive. Secondly, Christ-like conduct is corporate. It's we're a body together, the body of Christ. And so Paul talks about unity down in verse 27. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. It's all about unity. You can serve me. You're firm in the one spirit, we're all baptised into the one spirit, contending as one man, one person, one body for Christ. It's about doing it together. We share Jesus together. Jesus is in the midst, he forms us into his body together. The idea Paul has, um, when he says contend as one man for the faith of the gospel, he's got in mind the Roman fans. Do you remember the, the, the Roman soldiers? Um, and the legion of soldiers, they had all those um, shields that would interlock, like a tortoise. And they could lock their shields together in a long row, and then they put them over their heads as well, and they would be impregnable, and then they would march as one man forwards, I guess with their spear standing out in front of them, and they were unstoppable. They were going forward as one person. And Paul's got that in mind for the church. Stand firm as one person for the sake of the gospel. Because Christian conduct is united. Let's be united in our experience of following Jesus Christ as we seek to live out the faith. It's non-defensive, it's corporate, and finally, it involves suffering. Just as Paul finishes verse 29 and 30, it's been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him. 
since you're going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. You see, Paul follows a crucified Messiah. Jesus knew what it is, what it was to suffer. That's the shape of the Christian life, this crucible. Paul has embraced that in his ministry. If Christ suffered for me, I will suffer for him in the sharing of the good news. I'm not even willing to lose my head. And he says to the Philippians, and it's also been granted to you. If we follow Christ, we may well suffer for him. And we need to be aware of that in our discipleship. So whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. What is the gospel? It's all about Jesus. What's the worst that could happen? Well, we could go to be with Jesus. Do you believe that? And what's Christ-like conduct? It's non-defensive. It's corporate. And it may well involve something. Let's pray to you. Heavenly Father, thank you that the good news of the Gospel is all about Jesus, his life, death, his resurrection, and his coming again. Thank you that through faith in him, we can know the forgiveness of our sins and the hope of eternal life. Help us to embrace that faith that Paul expresses. To die is gain, because we enter into the presence of Christ himself. And help us to be non-defensive, united, and to stand firm and to be courage, and have courage when things are difficult. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Martin. Our next hymn uh, encourages us uh, as pilgrims together to live lives worthy of the gospel of Christ. And um, with that hope, with that trajectory, with that determination, please stand as we sing together.
to you go. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child, put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. And we remain standing as we declare our faith. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, who made the world? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in his Son, Jesus Christ, who saved mankind? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the Church. This is our faith. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please sit. For God's glory, not your own. Father, as we entrust our lives to you, help us to put you at the forefront of our lives and to remember Christ's example as a guide for us in everything we do and every decision we have to make. And we pray for the Church. Father, we entrust to you the small and complex problems facing your Church throughout the world. We think of all those in lay and ordained ministry and of each and every person worshipping you somewhere in the world today. We pray particularly for your church community here at St John's, for Greg, for Sophie and for Pat as they lead us forward over the coming months and years, caring for our present members and for those we pray will join us. We pray for those leading the Diocese of Lincoln and for all involved in the changes that will inevitably take place across the Diocese in the coming years. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for our local and national leaders. <coughs> Father, we entrust to you the local issues where feelings run high, the national and international matters of concern, and our longing for your kingdom to come on earth. In particular, we pray for all leaders as they make decisions about matters affecting world health, world climate, world security and safety, and people's lives generally. Guide all political leaders, both local and national, to reach conclusions that reflect your desires for our world. We pray particularly for those being persecuted in Afghanistan and for their safety. Lord, in your mercy, and we pray for our families and friends. Father, we entrust you, to you, our loved ones, those who are constantly on our minds, those who frighten us, and all who need us to listen to them better. We pray for those who we cannot meet in person at the moment, and we pray for the health and safety of all our families and friends in these coming months. We give thanks for all the modern technology that's enabled us to keep in touch with our families and friends. Give comfort to all those who still cannot meet up with or who live alone. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray for the sick and the suffering, 
Father, we entrust to you all who feel lost or disillusioned, those whose lives are plagued by resentment or guilt, who suffer and need comforting. Through these times of COVID pandemic, we give thanks for all those in the medical profession and for their skills and their care, sometimes putting themselves at personal risk as they do the best to comfort and heal the sick and suffering. And we've been asked to pray particularly for Ruth Wright, Margaret Rose, Phoebe, Carol Hudson, Mark Duckworth, Dorothy Duckworth, Kieran, Stella Davy, Victoria Smith, Nina Hepplethwaite, Alec Garden, Pamela Risley, Joan Speed, and Margaret Fielder. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray for the bereaved of the departed. Father, we entrust to you those who have died and those who will die today all humans and all who minister to their need. At this time, we give thanks for the lives of Eileen Halifax, Owen Lee, Mavis Webb, and Peter Gutterson. And we pray for their souls, and we ask for your comfort for their families and friends. Lord, in your mercy, Father, we entrust to you ourselves and the rest of our lives. May all our decisions, hopes, sorrows and joys be lived out as we seek to live out the life Christ wants us to. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> so there will be tea and coffee at the back, so whilst we express our fellowship together now in the peace, uh, we can do so at more leisure after the service. Please stand with me. Christ came and preached peace to each one of us, that we might be drawn together into one body. So the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let's offer one another a sign of the peace, keeping distance at the stage. And we remain standing for our third day. Lord Jesus Christ, you have come to us.
We give thanks to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right to praise you, Father, the Lord of all creation. In your love, you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your son. You embraced us as your children, and God and us to sit and eat within you. In Christ, you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice of sin. On the night that he was betrayed, at supper with his friends, he took bread and gave it thanks. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of me. His body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup, he gave it thanks and said, Drink this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of me. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that these gifts of bread and wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, may the Son of Christ come to the Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voice to join the eternal song in heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, and who stand in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, who stand in the highest. So let us sit and pray with confidence as our Saviour. Our Father, you are in heaven.
for your Son, that love is the fulfilling of the law. Grant that we may love you with our whole heart and our neighbours as ourselves, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we pray together for prayer on this week. Almighty God, we thank you for being us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And we stand to sing our final thing in Christ alone. Christ Son Jesus Christ our Lord. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Go in the peace of Christ. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.